Welcome. We're very happy you've joined us for this webcast on Formulating Great Rates, the guide to conducting a rate study for the water system. You're taking part in a webcast that's using a new guidebook published by the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. And actually, this is an enhanced guidebook in that, in that as we make this presentation, we have trainers from two different parts of the country, and we have PowerPoint slides that are embedded with additional video clips from experts around the country. Today we have two speakers joining us for the, for the presentation. Dan Banier from the Rural Community Assistance Corporation, which is based in uh, California. Dan works in the state of Washington. And Tom Fishbaugh, who works for the Great Lakes Rural Community Assistance Partnership, the program, and he's based in Ohio. And I'm Bill Jiraki, I'm your host. So let me introduce my uh, speakers for you today, our presenters. Our first presenter is uh, Dan Banier, and he's going to, to take about half of the presentation today. Dan has over 20 years of ex extensive first-hand working knowledge and experience in public works, maintenance and operations programs, capital improvement project management, utility and land use master plans, environmental regulation, budgetary and asset management, and various federal, state, and local government review processes. He's also a frequent speaker on municipal and utility issues before utility continuing education unit conferences and industry groups. Prior to joining RCAC in 2009, Dan served as a responsible official of the City of Monroe's water system in the management, administration, budget, capital improvement, and operational maintenance of the utility. During his tenure in Monroe, Washington, uh, Dan also represented the city on matters related to municipal authority, utility policy, land use activities, administration and training and safety and emergency response, water quality, cross-connection control, customer service enhancement, and a whole slew of other items. In fact, I don't think there's anything that Dan can't do. He also acted as the city's liaison to the county, state, federal, and tribal agencies. Dan is a past board member of the American Water Works Association's Inland Empire and Pacific Northwestern at Northwest Subsections. He has served as committee chair and member on the Pacific Northwest Section's Cross-Connection Control and Water Resource Management Committees and remains active with the Pacific Northwest Subsection of the American Water Works Association. He's a certified water works operator in the state of Washington as a level four water distribution manager and level two cross-connection control specialist. Welcome, Dan. Our, our other speaker is Tom Fishbaugh. Tom Fishbaugh is a water and wastewater operator who's certified in the state of Ohio for class two facilities. He retired in 2004 from municipal government and came to work for the Rural Community Assistance Program. And I'll tell you what, he's a tremendous asset to that organization, all those years of experience. Mr. Fishbaugh spent over 30 years operating and managing water and wastewater systems while employed by the City of St. Mary's, Sandusky County, Village of Republic, and the Northwestern Water and Sewer District. And while at St. Mary's, Mr. Fishbaugh was an operator at the water plant. He assisted in establishing the Sanitary Engineering Department for the County of Sandusky with the development of the rules and regulations, accounting procedures, rates, etc. He was village administrator in Republic and was instrumental in guiding the village to the construction of a new wastewater collection and, trans and treatment system. And just before starting with RCAP, Tom served as superintendent for the Northwestern Water and Sewer District, overseeing 18 employees and nearly 20,000 customers. Tom is a member of Ohio RCAP's Energy Efficiency Appraisal Team, and he is also past president of the Ohio County Sanitary Engineers Association and the Ohio Water Environment Association. He has also served on the board of directors for the Water Environment Federation, and he is a member of WEF and a life member of the American Water Works Association. Welcome, Tom. We're very happy to have these uh, experienced trainers with us today. And uh, what I'd like to do now is, is talk a little bit briefly about the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, based in Washington, D.C., but serving the entire nation through a set of um, regional organizations located throughout the country. Uh, Tom is from the Rural Community 
uh, Assistance Program in Ohio, the Great Lakes area. And uh, Dan hails from the state of Washington, which is part of the Rural Community Assistance Corporation uh, based in California. You can see from the map where those two organizations are located. Uh, this particular page in the manual helps you understand how to, uh, where these organizations are located and how to contact them for more assistance. So we invite you to do that as we, um, as you go forth and, and work through this manual, think about assistance you might need. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, turn the program over to Dan Banier, who's going to lead us through the first uh, section of the guidebook. Welcome, and thank you for attending, each and every one of you. First thing is that it's very important to recognize as board members or governing body that you have a fiduciary responsibility to operate and maintain the water system efficiently as well as effectively. And you have to meet the regulatory requirements um, that are established through the Safe Drinking Water Act as well as locally the level of service that should be established by, um, by the system in itself as well as what is required by the customers. And Jim Hugh of Oregon is going to speak to that very issue. But just remember, it's, it's up to you as a board to ensure the water system provides all of its customers with high quality drinking water. I think the Safe Drinking Water Act emphasizes financial management because everything comes down to finances. The purpose of the act is to standardize and set thresholds for operations of all water systems. The financial management aspect, if you have control of your finances and understand your finances, you're able to predict into the future what you need to do in order to be able to continue to operate the water system effectively and uh, efficiently. Okay, going on to the next slide, um, in your, as you develop your rates, some of the concerns that you need to look at is the rates should be based on the services of which you're providing. You are, in fact, providing a service to the customers. And in some localities, they do, in fact, insist that, no, you're not paying for the water itself that you're that you're using in your home, but in fact you're, you're paying for the service of which it takes to get the water from the source, be it a spring or a well, into your home. In fact, some water systems provide such personal service that they bring it right to your bathroom. So again, the rates are based on the service of which you're providing. And also keep in mind that you should not, these um, Rate revenues that you generate should not be used in the, for the general fund. This is strictly related to a enterprise funds, which are rate driven as opposed to sales tax or general uh, property tax. The water system uh, revenues are to pay for municipal services, or not to pay for municipal services, but in fact limit them to the enterprise fund. In some states, uh, there are possibilities where the utilities have the opportunity to make loans to the general fund at a given interest rate, which can be paid back uh, at an agreed time, be it a 10-year structure or what have you. Um, more importantly is to make sure that the customers understand what the rates are, how they're broken down, what its structure is, and basically what they're paying for. If they have a base rate, of $25 for 500 cubic feet, explain to them that you know, for this given amount of water, we're going to charge you X amount of dollars. If, in fact, you go over that base rate, then we go to what is known as a commodity rate. And that's going to be explained further in the, into this uh, webinar. The rate structure should be easy to understand by not only you as the board member, but also by everyone that explains it to their customers. And the customers should be able to understand it completely and in, its entire, and in its entirety. So moving to the next slide with re, um, rate development issues, the concerns that you might want to look at is that these rates, like your budget, your annual budget, should be reviewed regularly. Um, they should be used as a tool, actually, for the system sustainability. Um, the intent is that your revenues 
generated by the rates are supposed to exceed the expenses on an annual basis. So therefore, your water rates do, in fact, have a short lifespan. Um, the rate structures should be based on your customer classes or cl customer classifications. If, in fact, you have commercial development within your water system or community, you should have a commercial rate specifically for those. And Skip Ran, the Washington State RCAC, also speaks to that in some upcoming slides. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the rate structure needs to be not only easily understood by all, but also easy to administer. And going on to the next slide, some of the questions that have come up is the time for your system, is it time to examine your system's rate structure in itself? You have to ask yourself a uh, question is, which is known as the financial viability test. Again, that includes, one, whether or not your revenue exceed your expenses, which, which they should do. Um, no matter what kind of budget process you utilize, your revenue should exceed your expenses. And again, that should, your budget should be reviewed annually as your rate should be reviewed against the target number involved in your budget. Um, you need to meet the debt service requirements. You need to meet your operation and maintenance requirements. These are um, commonly known as funding reserve accounts. There's typically, what we have found is there's four reserve accounts, of course. One is a debt service if, in fact, you have any long-term debt. Uh, secondly, is your O&M operations and maintenance, which typically what we see in Washington State, according to the Department of Health, requires a 12.5% of your operating budget is set aside for operating reserves. The last two are capital improvement, short-term capital improvement projects, be it the purchase of a new vehicle, a new truck, a computer software system, or a computer for that matter, those types of short-term, short-lived assets. And last but not least, an emergency reserve should something go awry, a pump breaks, a generator stops, whatever the case may be within your water system, um, having enough in reserve for purposes of replacing that item without having a significant in, impact on the operating reserves. Moving on to um, the next slide, you also, again, need to examine your rate structure. You should do this review of your rate structure in itself as opposed to raising the rates. If your rate structure isn't working properly for your utility, no matter where you put the rates, the concerns are is that, that they may not work, they may not be equitable, they may not be fair to all customers or all customer classifications. You have to meet the cost of any emergency or preventive maintenance Programs that are outlined in your levels of service, as established by through as established through policy by the water system governing body, which this is speaking to, um, you have to maintain compliance with the state drinking water standards as well as the Safe Drinking Water Act. And again, last but not least, you should have or at least review your rate increases if need be um, in increments of at least at least every three years. The concerns are if you don't review them, um, inflation will eat up your rate structure just quickly. Um, always take a look at your rate structure before coordinating or before considering any raising of your current rate. Review your levels of service of which you're providing the cost of preventive maintenance, cost of compliance, and again, are your rates keeping up with inflation? You also have to consider that an outreach program and gaining public support, that not everyone will like a rate adjustment or a rate increase, but whether they like it or not, they should at least understand the 
rate structure and the rate itself, and that this rate should be equitable throughout all the rate classifications of which you have in your water system. Above all, make sure that it's easy to understand and easy to explain. And every, every classification needs to pay their proportionate fair share of the water of the water which they're purchasing. In regard to the next slide, in regard to the paying your fair share or your fair proportionate share, um, you have to understand the diversity of the rate and of the rate classifications. It's very important in what impact those customer classifications may have on your system. In, in a case of a medical supply, a medical clinic or a hospital, they may require uninterruptible water supply for whatever reason. Or an industrial park may require uninterruptible water, water supply. Are they going to be providing that through a generator or through backup storage or through pump connections? Or, or are you as the water supplier, the purveyor, going to be providing to that? Uh, Skip Rand speaks to um, the fair share or the proportionate share when you examine your different classifications. So with that, we'll give it to Skip. Does it really cost more to provide the actual amount of water to a commercial customer? More than likely, yes. The rationale is that a commercial customer is a larger user, not a three-quarter inch meter using the same amount of water as a residential customer. So when you get into larger meter sizes, there's a replacement cost that most utilities have to save money for. There's maintenance costs. There may be calibration costs. Uh, that in and by itself produces more costs. The concept of the actual cost of water is going to be based on the rate structure of the community. If you have base rate driven rates where most of the revenue is coming from your utility budget come from the service charge or base rate, you're going to find you're going to have a lower cost for water. The larger users are going to benefit from that. When you have commodity driven rates where the majority of your revenues are coming from the sale of water, the large users are going to pay more proportionally than the smaller users. And moving on to the next slide, uh, Skip also talks about the base rate and the flow rates. He talks about fixed costs as well as the variable costs. Typically we find that the fixed costs are tied directly to the base rate. It's called a fixed or flat rate. It's basically a service charge. Um, along with the base rate or fixed rate to cover the, the base, some of the costs and expenses that will not change no matter how much water you supply to your customers. Um, conversely, there's also a commodity rate, a per unit classification of water, and the ratio of base rate to commodity rate is you cover your fixed cost through the base rate and then any additional cost goes into commodity rate. Works, it works extremely well when you think about it. And the nice part about using a commodity rate is those large water users or users of a lot of water, be it commercial or industrial, they pay their proportionate share. And so the smaller water users are not supporting or subsidizing those commercial rates or those larger users. And then going to the next slide, there's a question that you also have to ask, is it actually time to increase the rates? John Franks of Idaho uh, reviews the rates against the budget. And again, it's very important that you, re you set your budget, establish what that is, and review the rates accordingly to meet that target. Yes, you should be looking at your uh, rate structures uh, at least annually uh, so you can marry uh, your income and your rates uh, with your budget to make sure that your income is going to be meeting your expenses for that budget year. Um, if you allow your rate structure to lag and don't uh, review them for three or four years, uh, most of the time they will not be keeping up with your expenses and then you'll have to take a large 
increase and it's just much more difficult for your ratepayers to take a large increase than it is to take a small incremental increase on an annual basis. As John mentioned, John Franks out of Idaho, it's important to review the rates in the budget regularly. Um, it makes it a little easier pill to swallow. As I mentioned earlier, you are responsible, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the system as well as all the customers served within that system. It's only fair. And we have to keep that, please keep that in mind. And moving to the next slide, you also have to look at when answering the question of whether a rate increase is needed, there are certain aspects and certain considerations that need to be given. If in fact, does your budget reflect the true costs of the operations? The true costs are just that. Uh, if you have a blip in the system, if you will, well, um, suddenly we had a water, fire hydrant, water main break that was catastrophic. It happens once in every 10 years. It was not um, foreseen based on the integrity of the pipe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's really something that it's a true cost in that the repair of that pipe may come out of your budget through your reserves as opposed to the actual O&M because your, operate, your cost of your operations and maintenance in effect reflect the true level of service. You can, the idea is to minimize the expense through streamlining your water system preventative maintenance programs. So instead of carrying around gas cans to put out fires, if in fact you are willing to pro provide preventative maintenance, so if there is an emergency main break, the crew can go out to the, there to the site having good as-built records, locating the mains to isolate locating the valves to isolate the water main and therefore being able to repair it efficiently as well as effectively. There are other utility systems where they may not know exactly where the valves to isolate this particular main are and that they, instead of reducing the isolation to a one or two block area, they go further out and further out and further out. And that really doesn't reflect the true cost of, of the operating, cost of operations. Um, the idea again is to minimize the expense and provide preventive maintenance throughout all of the programs of your levels of, and levels of service. And again, the revenue should always exceed the expenses if at all possible. Uh, streamlining operations, they truly help. There's short-term me measures that, that can be taken as well as long-term measures. And typically we see that there's a spike initially starting on preventative maintenance programs, but as time goes by and we're able to address asset management and what your plant is actually working and how it's operating, we find that we minimize the cost and maximize the efficiency of the product that you're using, be it a pump, the pipe, the fighter, the hydrant, or in fact some of the tools that you use on a regular basis. In the next slide, Skip talks about streamlining the operations and what we're looking for is basically an efficient efficiency within the system in all perspective of operations and maintenance. As an example, if your water system has unaccounted for, unaccounted for water, in effect leaks, if you will, that we're not able to account. You pump so much from, you take so much from the source and you bill so much consumption to your customers. And if it's not within 10%, let's hypothetically say that's 25% loss. Loss being that you can't account for the water. It didn't fight, fight a fire. It didn't go through a fire hydrant. It didn't go through the consumption meters of the, of the customers. Let's hypothetically say again it was 25%. So what you're actually pumping in your expenses and the revenue of what you're generating back is you're getting 75 cents on the dollar. That's not a very efficient way to operate your water system. It's certainly not a smart way. Another precaution is cash flow. You have to address your rates accordingly so that it doesn't reflect 
issues where some individuals are just simply not able to pay. Uh, there are provisions and policies which the boards can institute that would reflect some of the low to moderate income and basically support some of the payments. But those are policy statements that, that the water system has to take. Uh, Skip in this next video makes a really good point on limiting the customer services and limiting the amount of cutting back within those services for the level of service. Before a community raises their rates, they should do everything reasonable to ensure efficiency in their system. Efficiency, for the most part, is going to be an operations and a maintenance function. Probably the best example of uh, a common malady for systems is fixing the water leaks. When that water is just running out of a leak or the reservoir overflow, you're incurring costs for electricity, uh, time on the operator's part, as well as uh, chemicals. So fix those leaks. Making sure that uh, meters, particularly the large meters, are properly calibrated. Again, uh, those are your cash registers. Make sure that you get your revenues in. Make sure that your collection policy is up to date and you, have, you don't have people that haven't paid their bills in a long time. Any source of revenue that you can come up with will give you a chance to save money a little longer and forestall the rate increase. One of the things you do not want to do is artificially assume that uh, you're being efficient by, say, cutting back on your clerk's hours. I've worked in small towns where they keep cutting back, cutting back, and cutting back. Uh, people are upset because they call down there to City Hall and they can't get their work done. Uh, nobody's down there. So you've got to make sure that you're providing a, uh, a good service to your community, but not at the expense of your personnel. Well, thanks, Skip. And I think we're going to turn it back over to Tom at this point. He's going to be talking about some rate-setting worksheets.